So now we've come to a very special part of our program, which is the keynote address to be given by Laurel Thatcher Ulrich, the 300th anniversary university professor at Harvard. Uh, she really is someone who needs no introduction. I'm going to give a very small one, but if you want to learn more about her, you can find a full biography on the symposium website, along with biographies of the other speakers. Professor Ulrich is a pioneer and, and a leader in conceptualizing and animating objects, in teasing out history and producing knowledge from them, and in seeing objects as cultural actors and agents. One of the first signs of this deep interest she has is her book, The Age of Homespun, Objects and Stories in the Creation of an American Myth from 2001. But more recently, she has launched a very major initiative called Tangible Things, Making History Through Objects, which is a gen ed course an edX course, a MOOC, if you will, open to all, and a book from Oxford University Press that is just out. Um, and this book and the project and course all take a strategy much like that of our symposium, taking an assemblage of tangible objects and showing how each can teach us about our world. Of course, our symposium is also an assemblage of accomplished specialists and we're incredibly fortunate to have our keynote speaker among them. Please join me in welcoming Laurel Thatcher Ulrich. This is not a tortilla. Well, I see some of my TFs down there. It's not just a tortilla. It is a botanical specimen, an ethnographic artifact, a historical document, a work of art, and a Harvard curiosity. And I want to start with curiosity. One of the things we, of course, tell students when we're doing the history of Harvard museums is about the cabinet of curiosity, which is the foundation in the Western world of what we think of today as the modern museum, an assemblage of varied objects. And I'm interested in that word curiosity because it turns in a number of directions. It turns toward the object itself, and it turns toward the person approaching the object. A curiosity as an object, it can be uh, an odd thing, it can be a dazzling thing, it can be an unexpected thing. So there's something about a curiosity that um, sets it apart. Not always positively, you know, old curiosity shop, junk assembled, can't make your way through it but also it can be a source, as it was at the time of this museum, a source of wonder. But curiosity is also a desire to know, a desire to move beyond what is right in front of us, to learn more, to poke, to probe, to understand. And the argument that I would like to make by way of keynote today, and I think it's already been made very well, is that engaging readers, general public, museum goers, and certainly our undergraduate and graduate students with tangible things is a way to evoke curiosity. That beginning with almost any object, just by way of look at this thing and what's there and what engages you and what provokes you and what do you want to know. So that was the basis of the project that Julie mentioned, the Tangible Things Project, which was not my invention. It's one of those wonderful opportunities. I was in an elevator going to the top floor of what used to be called Holyoke Center, and I ran into a very tall man, 
who was at the time Winthrop Curator at the Harvard Art Museum, my friend Ivan Gaskell. Um, and he had just finished a, a, a book about one painting of Vermeer. And I had just finished a book about the age of homespun, artifacts, common everyday objects in early America. It seems like kind of an odd couple. But we discovered that we had a very common interest in approaching, approaching history through the close encounter with material things of all sorts. And so we began teaching small seminars together. And eventually, we took on something a bit bold. We decided we were going to do an exhibit in combination with a new general education course. And I think beginning 2009, 2010, we visited at least 17 different Harvard collections. And we went in and talked to curators, to archivists, and we told them our idea for this exhibit, which would be a way to teach Harvard history through its artifacts. And not the conventional celebratory Harvard history, but the unknown Harvard history, the Harvard history that would help us situate Harvard in the world in relation to issues of race and gender and environment and imperialism and the big themes that we deal with in our historical work. And we wanted to invoke curiosity. We wanted the things that didn't quite fit, the things that engaged these specialists who cared for these objects, the things that challenged the categories that Harvard, like other universities, had inherited from the 19th century, categories that kept art in one place for mainly Europeans and certain uh, so-called civilized people, as they were defined in the 19th century, and that assigned anthropology to those who were considered lower on the scale of civilization, those very frightening categories that none of us would consider that we were embracing today, but which still shaped what was in which museum and how you could have access to it. We also wanted to look at objects that came into libraries, often by happenstance alongside document or, or manuscript collections, and we wanted to engage with the science museums. And so we were so fortunate to be able to meet up with Sarah Schechner, the Wheatland curator at the Collection of Historic Scientific Instruments, who had a long experience of bringing, crossing boundaries and bringing different kind of artifacts together. And then with Sarah Carter, one of our former students who had completed her PhD and was teaching in the history and literature program, and then teaming up with the two Sarahs, uh, we added Sammy Van Gerbig, the designer and wonderful photographer. And together with about 50 at least wonderful supporters in the museums and libraries, we were able to do what we think may have been the first exhibit. It's a small exhibit, incredibly difficult and time-consuming exhibit that actually brought together artifacts from at least 17 different Harvard collections. And it was built around the theme of uh, curiosity and engagement. So this is the Chazzy Gallery, where the main part of the exhibit was held. We, along the side walls, we organized clusters of objects that defined the major categories of Harvard's museums, art, books and manuscripts, anthropology, natural history, history, and so on. And then in the middle, we created what we called our muddle. And these were things unplaced. Where did they belong? We made no effort to organize them around any theme. 
we just put them there in clear view. And we said to visitors and our students, where does this belong? Go ahead and sort this muddle if you can. We'd given them the categories along the wall, and here, here's your challenge. Can you sort the muddle? We also placed guest objects out of place in seven different galleries at Harvard. So here's a part of our muddle that brings together a life mask or a death mask of Abraham Lincoln, Samuel Johnson's teapot, some women's suffrage badges, and a quilt from the Artemis Ward Museum, one of Harvard's little known collections. And here, if you can see it in the foreground, is our tortilla. Our tortilla is placed between a cross section of a transatlantic cable that's a souvenir from the Artemis Ward House and a bottle of tapeworms from the Warren Anatomical Museum. These tapeworms were collected from Boston Brahmins, I'll have you know. <laughs> so there's no relationship among these things, except I guess the lid of the tapeworms is round, the tortilla is round, and the cross section of the cable is round, but that's an accidental uh, relationship. So what about our tortilla. How have we continued in our teaching and in our writing to investigate this truly amazing object? Well, I start out by saying it is, in fact, a botanic specimen. We found it because the librarians and curators in Harvard's herbaria found the most amazing things. And this was one of them. It came at their suggestion. They discovered it and, and showed it to us. You'll notice that the label is plural. But there appears to be only one object attached to the string in the hole poked in the round object. It's round if you've ever worked with clay and made a ball or with dough and then flattened it. You have a rough idea of how it was made, but it's curled as it gets dried, and there's a very sharp crack extending from the little hole at the top. Which, and there are scorch marks and other kind of marks on the surface. Now, the label says tortillas made from Zia maize, Mexico, J. and Rose, 1897, and then it gives a catalog number. In the 19th century, botanists at Harvard went out through the world collecting things. Sometimes they found things on the manure pile outside the Agassiz Museum. We had some fungi with that label. But others went to faraway places. And Harvard also acquired botanical collections from other institutions. Je Joseph Nelson Rose worked for the Smithsonian Institution. And his trip to Mexico in 1896 was primarily focused on cacti. You can see those in his photograph. He was interested in plants. But this was a period when botanists were thinking quite a bit about the human uses of plants. And so when he stopped at the end of the day in a little hut and had tortillas repaired by the woman of the house, he obviously collected one or more. We don't know if there were others distributed to other institutions, but one of these came to Harvard. This was not the first accession of tortillas. As I began to study this, I was stunned to learn about Edward Palmer, who is considered the father of ethnobotany. He was a physician during the Civil War who stayed in the Southwest and began to collect. So this 
was a real, one of those wonderful finds when I went to try to understand one tortilla. Well, what did I get? A whole jar of tortillas. And these are even older, having been collected by Edward Palmer in 1878. And you may not be able to tell at this distance, but the first tortilla was a little bit squatty and a little thicker than we might expect. These tortillas look very much like we would think of as a modern tortilla. And that, as I began to read the field reports from J.N. Rose and Edward Palmer, I began to wonder if there was a nomenclature problem and if one actually, as Rose said, was kind of like a hoe cake thrown in the ashes, was not actually a tortilla. These looked like those that were thrown back and forth in the hands of the maker, having the wet masa ground on the matati and then slapped onto the griddle and served hot. These looked somewhat different to me. Now, what's interesting as we look at this cover on the bottle is sort of the miracle of preservation here. You know, I've seen collections where anything edible has long gone to insects or animals. But they were very, very careful and they were using some kind of probably wax seal and then the cover over the bottle and these things and maybe a fair amount of poison. I don't know. I did not touch these objects. No one invited me to, but they have survived. Now, what's interesting to me is the label here from Edward Palmer. This is an ethnobotanical collection. So immediately, discovering this object helped me to see an interrelationship between two worlds in the late 19th century. Botany, the older discipline, really a foundational collection at Harvard, now coming together with a developing field of ethnography. And it's not surprising then that we find some of Edward Palmer's tortillas not quite so elegantly displayed in the Peabody Museum. And I can't uh, take time nor am I fully capable of tracing the complete provenance of these objects, but things move back and forth. Any of you have worked in the natural history in the Peabody Museum know that the boundaries within those museums that may seem so firm to us today as disciplinary boundaries did not prevail always as objects were coming into the museum. But ethnobotany at Harvard quickly was joined by something else. And that something else was called economic botany. And the most famous example of that is the Commercial Museum at Philadelphia, which opened shortly after the World's Columbian Exhibition. And now what we're doing is getting into the really meaty, interesting themes for a historian about our tortilla. This is not simply a collector going out into Mexico and learning about the culture of another people. This is about a large process, uh, and indeed an international process, of museum collections being tied into commercial expansion, to imperialism, and to the development of world capitalism. Ethnobotany was part in the commercial museum of finding useful products and making them available and known to entrepreneurs and merchants and manufacturers in the United States and assist in its raw economic rise in the world. So this brings us back to the label on our tortilla. Catalog 8535OA collection. And that is the Oaks Ames collection of economic botany. And Oak Ames was not around when this tortilla came in. He, eventually his name was attached 
to the economic herbaria, uh, herbarium at Harvard. The collection there is still called the Oaks Ames Collection. And he taught a course down at the Arboretum called Economic Botany. One of his students later wrote, he was far more interested in poison plants and orchids than in anything useful, which is why the students called it uneconomic botany. But in his notes, which survive in his small handwriting, he points to some very interesting developments that would occur later in the 20th century, such as the discovery that from maize, one could find a substitute for maple syrup. No one from New Hampshire would believe that, but there we are, the foundation at our own university of uh, the gradual move to what now is forbidden uh, from soft drinks. Okay, so what do we do with this tortilla? What do we do? This is not, I'm, I don't specialize in Mexico. I don't specialize in botany. I don't even specialize in the 19th or 20th century primarily. But I teach surveys of American history. I'm teaching a course on Harvard. And one of my deep specialties, of course, is the history of gender. And I'm interested in the history of everyday life. And I'm fascinated with this photograph, date unknown, obviously much later than our tortilla, which has been preserved with the other Harvard tortilla collections, Southwestern collections, and was apparently displayed either in the Peabody Museum or the economic botany exhibit, which did exist and does no more in the Natural History Museum. The, this very prettified example of the arduous and complex labor of producing a fundamental basic foodstuff through grinding and hand, um, hand production of cake after cake cooking on the matati. Now, this image, which is so attractive here, was used in literature in the late 19th century to stigmatize Mexicans as people who ground their women literally into the ground through the endless work of grinding, and to argue that maize was the corn of passive people who were incapable of higher civilization, and that what was necessary is to get machine milling and wheat into the, and this was coming even from the Mexican government in the late 19th century, to replace the maza tortilla and the hand ground tortilla with the wet corn with something milled, more efficient, more productive. And that uh, began to happen in many places, but something else interesting began to happen and that is, as migration continued, the um, corn uh, maza came into Hispanic culture. Somebody in a service station in Texas in the 1950s invented with an extruder into hot oil something that became the frito. So now the food of the overburdened Mexican woman has become the convenience food of the blue-eyed American woman who can make a quick salad out of, get this, mayonnaise, Fritos, and canned corn, maybe with the add of a little bit of green pepper. So in our class, we do a lot with the evolution of the tortilla over time. One of the reasons the object is so interesting to people and such an object of curiosity is because nobody can figure out why it's in a museum. <laughs> well, it's there because it once wasn't well known. It was considered exotic. It's so common today. And, to, to, and the, the way you know if you've got a good historical topic is if something doesn't make sense. And then you think something's changed 
and we need to understand how that has changed. So this has become a classic in our course, Tangible Things, where we put students to work with baggies of Fritos <laughs> doing close looking and examination of the object. And we think about the evolution from Frito kids in the 1950s to the, does anybody remember the Frito Bandito of the late 60s and early 70s? The pushback, of course, and that brings me to my third point. This tortilla is a botanic specimen, an ethnographic artifact. It's a, can it be a work of art? A uh, man, a Los Angeles artist named Joe Bravo, accidentally one day started painting on tortillas. He now has an international reputation for tortilla art. What's strange, to me anyway, is that he does this art on wheat flour tortillas, which doesn't seem to me nearly subversive enough. So that brings me back to this picture, close-up picture of our tortilla, which I have looked at many times as I've looked at the tortilla. Clearly, the scorch marks are important and suggest a way in which this object was cooked. But if you look very closely, what you see in this amazing material that has been transformed into an edible, once edible product, are little tiny black flecks. Now, yesterday I looked on the internet and put black flecks on corn chips and black flecks on cornmeal, and I discovered there's quite a debate going on in, on the internet on you know, those ask a question sources about whether these black flecks are bugs or black ground black pepper, <laughs> which tells us our lack of botanical knowledge and knowledge of uh, whole foods, I suppose, starting from scratch in making things. The black flecks are of course the result of the ripening of the hilum, the, what is sometimes called the navel of a seed. When it's fully ripe and you're using, we don't get it that, it's not black when we eat sweet corn, but when you eat, when you have field corn that's fully ripe, there's this little black speck. And the black fleck in the tortilla is an emblem that this is a whole grain that has entirely used. And when you get a perfectly yellow tortilla with lots of interesting additives, it will never have a black speck because they are afraid the consumers will think it's bugs or black pepper or not. Although some millers have managed to figure out how to add black specks for those who expect a whole grain product. So it becomes a very, very interesting problem in marketing that has produced some scholarly literature, actually. So who was I? I knew nothing about tortillas. I went into a collection at Harvard and saw something really weird. And because I wanted to help my students understand it, I began to do research, and they began to do research as well. Research in the collections, research into the larger culture. And it was a transformative experience for me. And believe me, none of our students wanted to eat the Fritos after they had examined them. So here is the uh, corn in the ZMAs from a beautiful photograph from Sammy Van Verriek. I now want to know more about botany. Never thought that would ever happen to me. So I may show up in one of your classes one of these days. I think that Sammy Van Verriek's picture of the tortilla maybe an even more interesting work of art than um, Joe Bravo's tortilla, although I find his 
tortilla paintings interesting. And so I just want to close with a few more of Sammy's pictures to tell you what can happen when we take our own curiosity to curious things that are all around us. The fairy armadillo collected by the Agassiz on the Thayer expedition to Brazil. A pot from the Semitic Museum excavated, it may have been a medicine pot, that has created this fabulous iridescence that Tiffany and others in the late 19th century tried to imitate. A turtle that apparently Henry David Thoreau collected at Walden Pond and through Sammy's camera eye, a very sense of the living specimen that is encased in that bottle. An epaulette from the Artemis Ward Museum that came with a fantastic and probably an accurate story. But the spangles on that epaulette, when we look at it closely. All these museums contributed to tangible things. I am deeply grateful for my colleagues we worked together and had so much fun, we didn't want to quit. So we wrote a book. But we could not have done any of this without the registrars, the curators, the conservators, the librarians, the archivists that made it possible. And I think we'll all agree with Sarah Putnam, who penned on her quilt, great objects make great minds. Thank you. <laughs> Does the word objects there really mean physical objects or aims? Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> Thank I think you. it's probably more the latter. That's what's fun. Um, it comes from, I, I think it's an objective or aims, probably. But we borrowed that. I think it comes from Edward Young's Night Thoughts. She, and she took some of her, she has inscriptions on, all over the quilt which is disintegrating. You can hardly, you know, it's a marvelously ragged artifact, but the inscriptions are fascinating. It's not a question, it's rather a comment. Uh, my name is Kanchi Gandhi. I am from the herbarium. I'm a botanist. I just wanted to mention that Zia Mays, whenever someone is eating a popcorn, they are eating really a fruit. It's a grass fruit. When you are eating an apple, you are not technically eating a fruit. But when you are eating a popcorn, you are really eating a fruit. This is the technical aspect. And I also want to mention that there has been some controversy whether Zia maize is really native to this place or it, has, it was native to the old world, whether there was any kind of exchange, this kind of Yes, uh, discussion has been going on. Very much an important part of the Atlantic exchange and, you know, rich and deep literature. I mean, you know, we could do a whole semester on, on maize and its various. Thank you very much. My name is Rebecca Kaufman, and I'm from the Cambridge community and an archivist for uh, the Stife Company. I'm curious about the people that you worked with in putting together this collection of collections. Were those people? collectors themselves, beyond their, their professional interest in these things, did they have collections of their own? Oh, that's a great um, question that you're asking. I can't say for all of them. They're Harvard employees, all of them that we worked with, and working in museums. I will say for myself, I have a, a collection of ordinary objects that I use in teaching because they can be manipulated, but I don't want to take care of anything 118 years old or anything valuable. And I think some of my other colleagues feel that way. Some like to collect, and some say, no, that's not what I do. Thank you. It's an interesting question. I'd like us to thank very much our keynote speaker. Thank you.